الحمد لله العلي الأكرم الذي علم الإنسان بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So insha'Allah ta'ala we're going to be continuing the lessons of the kitab Al-Waraqat by Abi Ma'ali Al-Juwaini rahimahullahu ta'ala And in the previous lesson we had finished the Ahkam Al-Taklifi Al-Tarabiyya And we had also finished Al-Wada'iyya So we finished the entire section of Ahkam And as always before we start the new section insha'Allah ta'ala We'll do a revision and a recap of what we covered in the previous lesson Bi'inillahi ta'ala so question number one is, we looked at al-wajib or wujub or al-ijab from different perspectives. Ghazi, can you tell me one of the perspectives of looking at wajib? So it's the i'tibar al-fa'il. Fa'il, good. So it's either going to be kifai. Uh, kifai. Or ayin. Ayin, good. Kifai means what? Communal. Communal obligation, that every one does not have to do it. Somebody has to do it from the community. Otherwise, everybody is sinful. For example, uh, adhan. adhan. If nobody does the adhan, everybody is sinful. But if somebody in the community does it, it suffices for everyone. Uh, the second one is wajib uh, aini. Example, uh, five, five daily prayers. I cannot make up for it on your behalf. Jamil, Ahsan. Abdul Rahim, the next way of looking at it is bi'tibari al waqt. What are the two? Or categorizations and then further categorizations. Mu'aqat. Mm-hmm. Mu'aqat means unrestricted. Mu'aqat set with the time period. The mu'aqat is further divided into two. Mu'asa. Mu'dayyak. Mu'asa means what? Mu'asa means that you have, you have the ability to complete multiple times in the time frame. Good. In the time frame that you've given, you, ha- you have the ability to do. Multiple instances of the same ibadah. Example? For the Good. So the time in Zuhur is min al-Zawal or Zawal al-Shams until Nasirul Dhulli Shay Mithlahu. Until the shadow of the object is the length of the object. The entire time, how many times can you do Zuhur? Many times. You have the possibility to do it many times. It is Musa. Mudayyak. It was one ibadah in that one time period, like, like uh, fasting, for fasting the whole month of Ramadan. You cannot do two fastings of Ramadan in one month of Ramadan. Jibbi. Ahsant. Who else? The brother here, what's your name? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. The last type of looking of wajib, from which perspective? No. Anjali, you can. Okay, I'll give you the hint, which is بَعْتِبَارِ الْفِعْلِ We didn't do fi'l. No, fi'l. Based on the action itself. It's two. This is for wajib. Wajib. The wajib is either not optional or optional, right? So a wajib aini, specific act of ibadah you have to do. You can't replace it with something else. Sometimes it's mukhayyar, optional. You can replace it with something else. You have an option of things, and whatever you do, it suffices. You can pick and choose. Example of the one you cannot pick and choose. Fasting. You can't choose to give sadaqah instead of fasting, or pray salah instead of fasting. When can you choose? The one example of the expiation. Expiation of al-halif, for example. Kafar al You have options. You can choose what you want to do. And any one that you do is, is sufficient. Ahsan. Good. Then we discussed sunnah or mandub. Tahmeed. What are other ways of referring to sunnah? Mustahab. Mustahab. Sunnah. Nafal. Nafal. Good. One last one that the author mentioned. Man. Mandu. Good. Ahsan. Uh, mubah, Saeed. What are the different ways of referring to Mubah? Yeah. Without looking. Al Aimu Ma Hawahu. Al Sadru. Knowledge is what's in your chest. Huh? Halal. Jais. 
first one is mubah. Mubah, halal, and jaiz. They're all the same. Good. Then we also looked at um, the issue of uh, batil and sahih. Batil and sahih fall under which ahkam? Abdul Rahim. Good. And is there a difference between batil and fasid? Hajj and Nikah. Good. And the rest of them, or the Ahnaf, sorry, different regarding the Ahsan. And that's a summary of what we covered, inshaAllah ta'ala. Our brother will read, inshaAllah ta'ala. فَلْيَتَفَطَّ الْمَشْكُورُ الْمَجْرُورُ From Al-Fiqhu, أَخَصُّ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ اللَّهُمْ أَفْضِلْ لَنَا وَلِشَيَاقِنَا وَلِلْحَافِرِينَ وَالسَّابِعِينَ وَلِلْمُسْلِمِينَ الْجْمَعِينَ قال المصنف رحمه الله وَالْفِقْهُ أَخَصُّ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ وَالْعِلْمُ مَعْرِفَةُ الْمَعْلُومِ عَلَى مَا هُوَ بِهِ وَالْجَهْلُ تَصَوُّرُ الشَّيْءِ عَلَى خِلَافِ مَا هُوَ بِهِ yeah. So the author now speaks about another host of issues. We finished the first section that spoke about ahkam, hukum. And we said hukum is not related to the study of usul al-fiqh directly. It is the outcome of studying usul al-fiqh. The author speaks about something and now he speaks about fiqh. Why? Why does he speak about fiqh? What's the munasada? Or we understand hukum because that's the outcome. Why fiqh? Why is he starting to now define fiqh and define ilm and ma'rifa and why? What's the significance? Is the fiqh what he's going to use to get to the hukum? Or is that you describing the process in that way? But this is usul al fiqh, we're saying, not fiqh, right? And you don't use fiqh to reach the hukum. Fiqh is the process itself. Or the hukum at the end, at least is called fiqh. That's all the same. Yeah, so remember, he finished defining usul, and the second word is what? Fiqh. So he's defining fiqh for you now. He says, وَالْفِقْهُ أَخَصُّ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ Fiqh is more specific than ilm. Ilm is all of knowledge. If you want to draw a square, who is familiar with uh, Venn diagrams? Square? Circle in the middle, right? You have a square, and the big square is, or rectangle, it is al ilm. Knowledge is a lot. You have knowledge of everything knowledge of science, mathematics, English, fiqh, usul al fiqh, neuro linguistic programming, IT, business, whatever. You have different knowledges. So, ilm, all of knowledge is a very big rectangle. In it, you have different circles. One of those circles is what? Fiqh. Okay? So what did he say? Al-fiqhu akhassu min al-ilm Fiqh is a specific type of knowledge It's not all of knowledge It's a specific type of knowledge Again, what's the reasoning why he would mention something like this? Istitarad He just went off topic Okay, he's just trying to give you an understanding of what fiqh is And the size of fiqh Then he goes back out to the bigger rectangle And now defines the ilm for you, knowledge and he says, a knowledge is مَعْرِفَةُ الْمَعْلُومِ عَلَى مَا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ And he said, مَا هُوَ بِهِ, صح? So, مَا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ or بِهِ Knowledge, he says, is مَعْرِفَةُ الْمَعْلُومِ Knowing معلوم the, the thing that you need to know As it is As it is And there is another definition of علم they say, إِدْرَاكُ الشَّيْءِ عَلَى مَا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ إِدْرَاكًا جَازِمًا إِدْرَاكُ الشَّيْءِ عَلَى مَا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ إِدْرَاكًا جَازِمًا إِدْرَاكُ الشَّيْءِ meaning perceiving something عَلَى مَا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ in the way that it actually is إِدْرَاكًا جَازِمًا with a firm perception I perceive something as it actually is in reality and I'll give you examples and all of this was called what? Maratibul idrak, the levels of understanding and conceptualizing and perceiving something. So all of this is called Maratibu al idrak, levels of conceptualizing something. And the highest level of conceptualizing something is ilm, is knowing something for what it actually is with certainty. Example, I see a chair there. Okay, if I see that chair, now I have a perception of it in my mind. And there's a reality that's out there. The reality is it's a chair. My mind tells me it's a chair. 
and this perception that I have in my mind of the chair is a firm perception. I know it 100%. I have no doubt it can be something else. What is this called? I, I perceive something and I compare it to what the reality is and if they're matching and my perception is 100% that is I, a certain knowledge of something. But sometimes you may have a perception of something and you compare it to the reality and it's something else. Example, I perceive that chair to be a car. In my mind, it's a car. In reality, what is it? Chair. Is that called an? No. Or if I see a chair, in my mind it's a chair, but I'm uncertain. It can be a chair and it can be a table, I'm not sure. Is that called an? No. So the components of the definition of ilm is mentioned in the one that I gave you. So this is a, one of the definitions of ilm, but the best definition of ilm is idraku shay'i perceiving something ala ma huwa alayhi in comparison to what it really is idrakan jaziman with a firm conviction. So perceiving something as it actually is with certainty. That is knowledge. That is knowledge. Then he goes on to Al-Jahl. Al-Jahl is what? We don't define it as ignorance, but you can define it as ignorance if you want. Loosely translated as ignorance. He says, um, did you read it? No. Hold on. Um, he says, Al-Jahl is tasawwur. Notice the difference of the usage of the word. When he said ilm, what did he say? Ma'arifa which is certain knowledge. When he defined jahl, he didn't say ma'rifah. What did he say? Tasawwur, perception, perception. Okay, and when we used the word or the definition of ilm, what did we say? We didn't say tasawwur, what did we say? Idrak, idrak. So there's a difference again, this is where English is limited, and I use the word perception, but it's not actually perception. It's idrak, and it's a bit different than tasawwur. What's a better way of saying idrak? It's more of perception but with more certainty. It's, you can say perception with conviction. Is there a word for that in English? So it's not just having a perception in your mind, it's having a perception with a good idea of what you're thinking about. In any case, notice how we use the word perception. So if that chair I see and I conceive it in my mind to be a car, what is that called? Jahl. I've got it wrong. I've got it wrong. So the maratib al idrak are five. We took them from the beginning, right? In the beginning of the lesson. The first highest level is what? Ilm. When I know something 100%, it's called ilm. Knowledge. I know this thing and I'm certain about it. Ilm. Second level is called Adhan, which is high possibility or possibility. Adhan. Number three is Shak, when it's 50 50. Then there is Al Wahm, delusion, and then there is Jahl, ignorance. These are the five levels of perceiving something. So if I see something and I think of it in my mind and it is matching the reality and I have a firm determination and belief, what is it called? Ilm. If I see that chair and I'm on the fence, but I think very likely it is what I think it is. So I see the chair. In my mind, I have two possibilities. In my mind, my mind tells me 90% it's a chair and 10% Maybe it's a broken chair. I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a working chair. So let's say this chair works. In my mind, I have two possibilities. One possibility, 90% I think it's perfectly fine. 10% I think it might be broken. This 90% is called what? Mudan. I don't call it an ilm because ilm is always 100%. Clear? If I look at the chair and I'm trying to determine the color of the chair, what color is that chair? Huh? What do you guys think? This chair? <laughs> black or dark grey? Who says black? Who says dark grey? No one, just me then, huh? 
Okay. So there's a black chair. Let's say so in reality it's a black chair. Okay? Shuk is when I look at it, in my mind I have two options again. 50% of my mind thinks mm, it's a black chair. Another 50% thinks it's a dark grey chair. What is that called? Shuk. I'm on the fence. I actually can't make up my mind. I'm 50-50. If I'm 51-49 and I choose the bigger option and the higher option, what is that? That's the one. That's the one. Okay? Then, if I look at it and there's two options and it is black and I say it's dark grey. I say, I'm like, it is dark grey. So yeah, it's black. I say, no, it's dark grey. What is this called? Well, I'm deluded. All of you are telling me it's black and I'm saying dark grey and I am, I am deluded. So, that is called al wahm And the last one is jahil. When I conceive something and it's opposite to the reality. I look at this and I say it's a car. And everybody says, Akhi, you're blind. It's, it's a chair. So, what is that? Ignorance. And if you look at it or you point towards it and you say, what is that? And ignorance is of two types. Jahlun basit and jahlun murakkab. Jahil basit is called simple ignorance or basic ignorance. Jahil murakkab is compounded ignorance. Compounded ignorance. So if I, you come to me and you say, what is that? Okay. And I say, Allahu alam, I don't know. What is that called? Basic ignorance. I just said, I don't know. But if I look at it and you say, what is it? And I say, Akh, it's a train. Everybody says it's a, it's a chair. I say, no, I'm, I'm convi convicted, convinced it is a train. And clearly it's not a train. And I'm firmly rooted about my belief. What is this called? Jahan Murakkab. I'm wrong in what I assume of it. And on top of it, I'm not even convinced with you guys. So what does it mean? Waham? Waham? That seems the If you were to say it's a train, you so it's the amount of perception that I have of it. Yes. So when waham, waham is when it's, I choose that option, but I believe there is a stronger option in the equation. Yeah. It's like I have two options and I, I choose the wrong option, but I'm not convinced about it. I'm still like, I think this is what it looks like. But if I say, no, everybody's wrong. And this definitely is what it is. This is called jahil murakkab. Is when someone is convinced about something and this is the harder type of ignorance to resolve. If somebody says, Akhi, no, this is an apple and it, it's an orange and he's, he's convinced it's an apple, it's hard for you to change his mind. Just like the people who are convinced that Mawlid is permissible. They're convinced. Uh, what was the fourth level again? Fourth level. Waham. Waham? Yeah, waham. Waham, and then the fifth one is Jahl. So Mawlid, people that are convinced about it, this is Jahl Murakkab. They believe it is permissible and they have conviction in their hearts. And it's clearly something that is wrong. And no matter how much you convince them, because they believe it to be right, they're not going to be convinced. When it's come to somebody who has no idea, you say, okay, it's not allowed. You say, you ask him, Mawlid, is it allowed? He says, what is Mawlid? I don't know. I don't know if it's allowed or not. And then you can convince him. You have a leeway and he was more likely to listen to you. Yeah. How do you spell Jahl? Jahl? Yeah. Ba, Seen, Ta. Listen. Ba, Seen, Ya, Ta. Listen. So Jahl, Basit, and ignorance is two types. Basit is what? It is Adam al idraki aslan is not knowing something altogether. Not knowing something altogether. Jahan murakkab is knowing something, but it opposes the reality of what it is and ma'rifah. So it is knowing it with conviction. And why is, why is this section even important and why does the Shaykh he brings it here? What's, what's the relationship of this with regards to rulings in Islam? Example, certain rulings in Islam are conviction, are yaqeen, ilm, certainty. And you cannot go wrong. You can't say there's a possibility of anything else. If I say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ 
Allah is one. What do you guys say? What kind of perception is that? N. Certainty. There is no maybe Ahad means ten or Ahad means two. No. Okay? But for example, the issue of whether camel meat breaks your wudu or not. This issue is what? An issue where there is ijtihad. And when I choose and I say, yes, camel meat breaks your wudu based on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. I know this, but I had to work for it. And there is an ihtimal, there is a possibility on the other fence. Even though I don't believe it to be strong, there is another possibility. And if I chose the correct one, what is this called? Dhan. This is called dhan. So it's giving you understanding when you derive a ruling in Islam, how strong that ruling is. Now, majority of fiqh, majority of fiqh is what kind of knowledge? Is it ilm, yaqini, certain knowledge, or is it most likely knowledge? One. Majority of fiqh is, falls under one. Now. Fadlah. Ahsanallah ilayk. والعلم الضروري ما لا يقع عن نظر واستدلال فالعلم الواقع بإحدى الحواس الخمس وهي السمع والبصر والشم واللمس والذوق أو بالتواتر والعلم المكتسب ما يقع عن نظر واستدلال والنظر هو الفكر في حال المنظور فيه والاستدلال طلب الدليل now, so the author he now breaks down ilm into two further aspects. Now, why is he speaking about all of this again? There is a link to usul al fiqh, but a lot of it is because usul al fiqh was influenced with ilm al kalam, the science of ilm al kalam, and there's a lot of mantiq, and of course they have to use a little bit of logic regarding it. But it has a relationship in usul al-fiqh in, in a bigger picture. So he goes on to you breaking down knowledge into two types. Write it down. The first type of knowledge, as the Shaykh says, is ilmun daruri. Ilmun daruri. Which means essential or necessary knowledge. Essential or necessary knowledge. Number two. The second type of ilm is ilmun nadari. Nadari. Or ilmun muktasab. You can call it either way. Ilmun nadari or ilmun muktasab. Knowledge that is nadari, which means it's acquired through thinking and pondering and analyzing. It is acquired through thinking, pondering, and analyzing. And the first one is essential knowledge. And as the Shaykh, he says, مَا لَا يَقَعُ عَنْ نَظَرٍ وَاسْتِدْلَالٍ It requires no analysis. It's knowledge that is inherent in a person. It requires no looking into. So two types of knowledge. عِلْمٌ ضَرُورِي And he breaks down عِلْمٌ ضَرُورِي and he gives you examples. He says, it's like knowledge that comes about through the, the five senses. This is called علم ضروري. علم ضروري is when this knowledge, you can't go wrong in it. There is no two ways in it. You don't require thinking on pondering. For example, if a child sees a fire, the child knows the fire burns. The child comes close to the fire. As soon as he comes close, he knows the fire. Fire will burn my hand. Who placed this knowledge in the heart of the child? Allah. But did the child need to learn about this? Did the child have to sit in a classroom and say, fire is hot, fire is hot, and then the child knows? No. It's knowledge that is instilled in the child by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Essential knowledge. He did not have to learn or acquire. The child didn't have to sit and think. It happened like that. Okay. If I say to you brothers, one plus one, what is it? Two. Does anybody have to take out a calculator and... No, it's knowledge we all know. One plus one is two. That is knowledge that is essential basic knowledge. Like that is the ilm that you acquire through your five senses. If I see a horse, me seeing a horse and believing it to be a horse is essential knowledge. Me hearing thunder from my ears and then I hear thunder, what do I think it is? Thunder. I don't need to think about it. 
I don't need to analyze, I don't need to process that information for five, six hours and then say, ha, ah, that was thunder, I think, yeah. If I hear, I see. I touch, something is hard, I touch it, I know it's hard. If I touch it, it's soft, I know it's soft. It's basic knowledge. I don't require to analyze the information before I come to the conclusion. This is called Ilmun Daruri. So he says, something that is known through Hawas al khams the five senses. Number one, as sama You hear something, it is what it is. You hear a car screeching, it's a car screeching. al basar you see something, it is what you saw. Uh, as a sham smelling something. You smell something pleasant, that is what it is. You've smelled something pleasant, it was a pleasant smell. al lams you touch something hard, it is hard. You touch something soft, it is soft. And the you tasted something sour, it is sour. You tasted something bitter, it is bitter. And you don't need to process that information. You don't need to process that information. That's the one category of information that the Sheikh called and gave you as an example of ilm daruri. Five senses. So what is seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, and smelling. Smelling, tasting, touching, hearing, and seeing. So seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting. Five. So these are the first example of ilm that is daruri. The second example of ilm that is daruri, he says, at-tawatu. Something known through multiple chains of narration. Who here has been to Japan? No one. We've been to Japan. Okay, I can use the example then. Who here believes Japan exists? You've not seen it, how can you believe in it? Huh? You've not seen it. How do you guys know Japan exists? Who told you? How many people told you? Huh? They told me Japan, They could have been Chinese, I don't know, they lied to you. Huh? They could have been from another place. You never know. Ahsan. So this is called Tawatur. This knowledge has come to you through multitude narrations. And it's impossible for those narrations and multitude sources to conflate and come about with a lie. Impossible. It reaches a limit where it's impossible for them to conspire a lie and say we're all going to lie to the rest of the human beings and say there is a country called Japan when in, re in reality it doesn't exist. This is called Mutawatir. This knowledge is certain knowledge. I don't need to look into it. And the fact that I said, who believes it exists? <coughs> Almost everyone, not even one second, and they raised their hands and said, I believe it exists. It means what? It's firmly rooted in your heart. You never had to think about it and say, mm, let me look into it. No, you guys believe it exists. So, why? Because it came to you through multiple sources. Like, how do you know your mother is your mother? Who here believes their own mother is their mother? Uh, prove it to me. Uh, who can prove it to me? That's all that can prove it to me. You can't. DNA. They could lie to you, okay? The lab could lie to you and say, yeah, pass. But it's not. Uh, what other way do you know? Your father told you, your mother told you. The DNA test possibly, and they can lie. What else? The nurse that was there, if you track her down and you find her, maybe she can tell you. But otherwise, you only have two, three sources of information telling you your mother is your mother. When it comes to certain hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu we know it with more conviction than we know that our mothers are our mothers. We have it through multiple chains of narration, multiple sources, just like even the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah is mutawatir. It's through different sources, a man in China, a man in Afghanistan, a man in Africa, a man in the Middle East. They all believe in the same thing. Okay? Now, so the point is, this knowledge that comes to you is mutawatir. Another example of this is, who here believes World War I happened? Were you guys there? No, but how do you guys know it actually happened? Mutawatir. Everybody knows. Everybody's been told, it became like knowledge that is 
essential knowledge. Jamil. Then you have knowledge that is muktasab. And this knowledge is knowledge that requires you to think and ponder. And the Shaykh he says, ما يقع عن نظر واستدلال. It is something that requires looking into. If I say, brothers, 239 plus 455 divided by 10 and multiplied by 10,000 and the square root of all of that, uh, who can do it from the top of the mind? You can. Yes, actually, one second calculator. That's your answer, right? You have to think about it. You have to analyze before you come to the conclusion. This is called what? Ilmun. Muktasim or Nabali. It requires looking and investigating. Now, why is this important? Certain knowledge in the Sharia ah is daruri. Like Allah exists, Allah is one. You don't need to analyze any evidence, it's known. And like the Prophet is true, ilmun daruri. There is no looking into it. The name of the Prophet is Muhammad, essential knowledge. And certain types of knowledge in the Sharia ah is what? You have to investigate. If I say, brothers, what is the ruling of, for example, is, is for example, standing up in the prayer whilst you're traveling if from the pillars of the salah or not? Do you know it right away or do you need to look at the ahadith? You have to look at the ahadith, you have to investigate. So that is called ilmun. Nobody. Again, all of this, like I said, does it directly have to do with usul al-fiqh? No. But it helps you understand usul al-fiqh and your idea when you derive rulings better. That's all it is. Yeah. Clear? Anyone have any questions? Right, so you describe this muktasab, that's the one you have to look into. Muktasab, yes. Muktasab or nadari is the one that you have to look into. Yeah. Hold on. He, he then says, um, he then defines another, which is looking into. He says, "Who al fikru fi hal al madhuri fi?" Another, he says, it is looking or thinking about hal al madhuri fi, the situation of what you're looking into. Another is thinking about what you are looking into. And by the way, according to the scholars of Mantaq, this definition is weak. Why? No. No. Not at all. No. This is called a dawr or a dawran. Is when I tell you to define something, in the definition you use the word and define it by using the word itself or any of its der derivatives. So when you define nadar, in the definition is what? Mandur. In the definition, when he came to define nadar, in it, in the definition is the same word he's trying to define. The scholars of logic see this to be a weak definition. It's like if I say define a car and you say a vehicle that has four tires. A vehicle is a synonymous term with car. You have to define the word car with something new that's not in the word itself. If you do that, it's called a dawr. And some scholars call it a dawran. And that is seen as weakness in definition. In any case, why is he defining nadar? Because it's a part of a, the definition of the word علم ضبوري and علم مكتسب. He says ما لا يقع عن نظر. Something you don't require nadar. He has to define nadar again. Sometimes when I say looking into something, you all, all understand what it is. I don't need to necessarily define it. Me defining the word nadar just makes it more complicated. It's like defining the word water. If I say, brothers, what is the definition of water? Or like Ibn al-Qayyim, he says that some things are so evident, you don't require to define them. Like mahabba, love. You don't need to. There's a big discussion amongst the scholars, what is love? Ibn al-Qayyim says, love is love. Mahabba is mahabba. Bas. It's so evident, I don't need to define it. Me defining it just makes it more complicated. And that's why the, the lines of poetry, when a man was told to define water, and then he went to his room, he sat, and he, days later he came out and he said, I have the best definition of water. Water is water. Best definition. It is what it is. 
Don't try to define things that are evident. Like for example, if I come to a group of Muslims like ourselves and I say define Salah. All the Muslims know what Salah is. I don't need to define it for them. Right? If I say fasting, you all know what fasting is. Right? So this is something that sometimes the scholars they do and it's not required. So he says another and he defines another again. Nadar just means looking into something. Istidlal is what? Talab al-Dalil. Istidlal is looking and requesting for evidence. And again, does he really need to define it? We know what istidlal is. Dalil, Dalil is what? Evidence. Dalil is evidence. Does he have to define it? Nobody defined it anyways. He says, هو المرشد إلى المطلوب. It is the thing that takes you to your objective, which is evidence. Okay. Again, a lot of these terms don't really need to be defined like that. Now, Now, so adhan he says, and adhan is one of the maratib of idarat, levels of perceiving something. He says tajwizu amrain, having the possibility of two things, ahaduhuma alharu min al-akhar. One of them. Is or akhir, or akhir, naam, akhir. One of them is more than the other. So one is when there's two possibilities and there is a higher possibility than the other one. One is sixty percent, one is seventy percent, uh, forty percent. Which one is one? Sixty. One is seventy percent, one is thirty percent. Which one is one? Seventy. The higher possibility is one. Okay. Naam. <laughs> Now, shak is the opposite. Shak is the opposite. Or similar to when the 50 is 50 and 50, that's called shak. 50 and 50 is called shak. No, not the opposite. Actually. Now, one last issue before we carry on. Now, do we act upon one in our religion? Can we act upon one possibility in our religion? If I don't know something with 100% conviction, can I act upon that knowledge that I think is higher possibility? Who says yes, raise your hand. Who says no? No? So you have to act upon something that is 100%. The brothers who said yes, raise your hands. Good. What do you guys do with the ayah in the Quran? إِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا Allah says they only follow dhan and Allah says um, You follow your desires, Allah says Allah, Allah equated it to following your desires How did you respond to that? Allah is dispraising dhan What about when you're in the salah and make mistakes? I gave you an ayah in the Quran. Uh, I need evidence to say that you can act upon one. You don't look for evidence. Close. Very close. Very close. Very close. Close, very close, almost there. Good, but there is a. What's the thun that they mean? In the ayah. So this is a thun that is marjuh, the weaker thun. So, so when you have sixty percent and forty percent, this forty percent is still called thun, by the way, and sixty percent is a thun. Yes, this the weaker one we call it wahm, but it's a level of thun. It's when they're in the face of clear evidence that looks strong, which the brother mentioned, and then they choose the other option because of their desires. Does that make sense? And there's evidence in the Quran that tells you to follow one who knows the ayah. When Allah is telling you or allowing the following of one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the situation of a woman that is divorced by her husband. And this is the third divorce, which is called al bainuna Al-Kubra. They're divorced. And they can only come back together, so the woman, 
Once she's divorced the third time, she can only come back together with her ex-husband after, after the ex-husband or the new husband, she marries another person. This new person naturally dies a natural death or she naturally divorces this new husband. Then she is now single again. And now she has a high possibility if she gets back with her ex-husband, things will work this time. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in ghanna an yuqima hudud Allah. Ghanna. Meaning, they have a high speculation, high possibility, things will work out this time. Then, yes, no problem, you can remarry your ex-husband. Uh, question? Uh, so, dhan is acted upon. And there are other aspects in the religion where you can act upon dhan. Example, and which the brother is right. If, for example, this case is in our lives as Muslims, we act upon what seems to be the stronger case. I'm, I'm praying my salah. Yes, I had wudu when I started. Did I lose my wudu or not? I'm uncertain. But most likely I still have my wudu. You have your wudu. Or for example, it's fasting, Ramadan. I look into the sky, I don't have a phone, I don't have a GPS, I don't know what the time is. I look into the sky and I can't even see the sun. I don't even know if it's Maghrib time. However, yesterday Maghrib was at 6.31. Yesterday. Today, I look at my phone, 6.32. But I can't see the sky, I don't have a GPS, I don't have internet. Most likely, it's what? Maghrib time already, most likely. I'm not certain, but it's most likely the case. Maghrib has entered, I'm allowed to open my fast. Why? Because that's the most likely case. If yesterday Maghrib was 6.31, today it's 6.32, Maghrib most likely happened. So I can act upon dhan in a lot of aspects in my religion. The dhan that is blameworthy is the one that is in line with the person's desire. When the ayat and the evidences are clear, but they still choose to follow their desires. Clear? Now, tell me. Asanullah وكيفية <تصفيق> So now the author defines for you Usul al Fiqh. All of this that we've covered so far is still in the introduction of the book. He is now defined to you Usul al Fiqh. Now he defined Usul separately, he defined Fiqh separately, he went on a tangent. For a few chapters, then he came back now again. He's brought usul and fiqh and brought them together, and now he's defining usul and fiqh as one single word, as a laqab, as a title of a subject. And he says, usul al fiqh turqu ala sabil al ijmal is the different ways generally. Wa kafiyatul istidlali biha, and how do you derive rulings? You had a different, another. What's after it for you? Wa ma'ayatubadani. Who, who has the version of uh, Abdul Mahsin al Qasim? Does he have that section? It doesn't. Is that Sheikh Abdul Mahsin's one? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. What, what does it say? It doesn't say why it's for that. Yeah, that's the version that I also have. In any case, it seems like. Again, a lot of scholars, when they define usul al-fiqh, they define it as only two parts. They will define it as what is, what's usul al-fiqh? What did you define it as? Ma'rifatu ahkami, shari'ati ijmali, mukaifiyyatu al-istidlali biha. So, wal mustafid. Now this last section, a lot of the scholars don't even define it. If you go back to the Kita uh, the Nadal Maraq al-Saud, 
by Abdullah ibn Hajj al Shinqiti, he does not bring you the third one. He just defines it using two things knowing general evidences of fiqh, and number two, how do you extract the rulings? They don't even mention things related to mufti and mustafti and things like that. But it's lazim, it's from a part of usul al fiqh, anyways. So, what is usul al fiqh? It is what? Knowing what can be used as a evidence in the Sharia. Ah. So, they will not come to specific evidences, meaning they will not open the Quran and look at one or two or three or four ayat to determine whether this is an evidence or not. What are they going to look at? The entire Quran completely, as a whole. Can I use Quran for evidence? Can I use Sunnah as evidence, generally? Can I use Ijma' the whole thing as an evidence? That's what they're looking at. They're not looking at this specific ayah, can I use it or not? Or this specific hadith, I can use it or not? Or this specific ijma' I can use it or not? No. So what are they discussing? General evidences of fiqh. General evidences that will allow me to reach a fiqh ruling. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so the fiqh is like a framework. So if you open a book of usul al-fiqh, for example, do you expect to see a list of ijma'ah? No. What are you going to see? They'll define ijma'ah. They'll define how we can use ijma'ah, whether you can use it or not. The evidences to prove ijma'ah does exist. And masail related to ijma'ah. That's what they speak about. They're not going to bring you ijma'ah number one that exists, ijma'ah number two, a list of ijma'ah, no. They're not going to bring you a list of ayat of the Qur'an. What are they going to discuss? Qur'an, how do you derive rulings from the Qur'an, that's it. That's what they're going to discuss. So it's the first thing is what? Is adillatul fiqhi ijmalan, general evidences of fiqh. Does everybody understand the difference? Okay. Second thing is what? Turuq al istanbat How do you derive the rulings from it? How do you derive the rulings from these evidences in a general way? In a general way. And we discussed this before. صح? Everybody understand what usul al-fiqh deals with? Knowing what evidences you can use in fiqh and how do you derive rulings from them. Third topic was what? Who can do the process of this de deriving? Which is the condition of a mujtahid. If I want to be a person who can go to the Quran and sunnah and derive rulings, what are my conditions? Do I have to know Arabic? Do I have to have memorized the Qur'an? Do I have to know a number of ahadith and things like that? Okay? So the shaykh then he brings you after that Abwab Usul al-Fiqh Chapters in Usul al-Fiqh He gives you a, a summary of what he's going to bring in his book That's the whole summary, the whole, that's the whole book So let's take it one by one And try to put it into these three sections Either it is going to speak about general evidences of Fiqh Or ways of extracting Rulings or the rulings of a Mufti and Mustafti. So the first one, Aqsamul Kalam. Where does it fall under? So is it trying to say what kind of evidence you can use? Second one. Because if you have some Aqsamul Kalam, then you go to evidences. But it's not the way of extracting rulings, right? Why would they need to say whether kalam needs to be used as an evidence? Kalam is what the evidence is. So, 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 so. Kalam. Speech. Not really. I know what you're getting at. It's a good attempt, mashallah. But there's a trick question, actually. Because this external kalam is maybe what you can say none of the three. It's the muqaddimat of usul al-fiqh. Because you have to apply usul al-fiqh fiqh on what? Speech. So then they define to you what is speech for you to apply usul al-fiqh on it. For example, I see an ayah in the Quran. It is what? Speech. So I have to apply usul al-fiqh on it. So it's more of the muqaddimah of usul al-fiqh. It's a prerequisite of wanting to start to learn usul al-fiqh and apply it. That's what it is. So you can say muqaddimah. Next one. Al-amr wa nahi Command and a prohibition When you look at the ayah of the Qur'an How do you know Allah is commanding you to do it? 
How do you know Allah is telling you not to do it? Where does this fall under? Second one. How do you extract evidences? Al-Am wal khas When is something general and when is something specific in the Quran? Second one as well. Mujmal wal mubayyan When is something ambiguous and something is clear and unclear? Same one. Al-Zahir wal muawwal Same. Al-Af'al So where people get stuck. What is meant by af'al? First, understand what is meant by af'al. What is meant by it? It's the actions of the Prophet. Can the actions of the Prophet be an evidence or not? So what is which section does it fall under? First one. What is what can be used as an evidence? Af'al here means actions. Af'al of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Can it be used as an evidence or not? Al-nasikh wa al-mansukh. So again, al-nasikh wa al-mansukh, you can add it as lawahiq. Or you can add it as lawahiq. Or you can say masail of usul al-fiqh. Issues in usul al-fiqh that you can't categorize in the three sections. Like what he's about to mention after it, which is tartib al-adilla. And in order of evidence, what is stronger? An evidence from the Quran or a sunnah? Quran, but this concept of which one is stronger than the other or if a ayah or hadith is explicit and there's an implicit ayah or hadith which one is stronger explicit so this is called tartib al-adilla and uh, tarjih and nasikh al musukh all of this are masail of usul al-fiqh there are issues in usul al-fiqh nasikh al musukh then al ijma' First one, knowing whether you can use ijma' as a proof or not. Al akhbar. What, what is akhbar? Information. Huh? The akhbar here refers to the akhbar from the Prophet. So mutawatir ahad. So it is first one. Qiyas. First one. Can you use analogy as an evidence in the Sharia to prove Islamic rulings? Yes or no? That is one of them. Al hadru wal ibaha. It is. Al-Hadru or Ibaha? Now? The second one. No, it's the first one. Here, Ibaha and Al-Hadru actually means um, Istashab, a form of Istashab. Okay, it's not Mubah. Slightly different. We'll come to it, inshallah. Tartib al-Adilla. Which evidence is stronger? In none of the three. It's a mas'ala. It's an issue of usul al-fiqh. Istashab al-Hal. Also, first one, which can you use istashab, meaning if something has an original default state, can you use that as an evidence? Example, the original state of ibadah is what? Impermissibility, mana. If I want to do an act of ibadah, the original essence is I'm not allowed to do it. So if somebody says, Akhi, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray uh, a, a sixth salah, a new salah, five daily prayers, I'm going to add a sixth one. You say, Akhi, it's not allowed. He'll say, Akhi, where's your evidence? Give me an ayah in the Quran. Give me a hadith of the Prophet. You don't have it. So what are you going to do? Can you say, istathab? Yes, you can use it as an evidence. Again, it's the evidence that is مختلف فيها. Then they have, وصفة المفتي والمستفتي. The rulings or the situation of a person who gives fatwa and receives fatwa. Third one. أحكام المجتهدين. The third one as well. Clear? This is an overview of the entire book. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, somebody here had a question? Okay. Sometimes I imagine somebody raising his hands. Uh, okay, khair. So, we still haven't started the book, or the crux of Usul al-Fiqh. He starts with Aqsam al-Kalam, and breaks down Aqsam al-Kalam into different types, and then the book or the crux of Usul al-Fiqh starts from Al-Amr, which is a few chapters later. We're going to finish all the way till before Amr and then we'll stop. Al-Amr, I want to start it on a fresh lesson, insha'Allah ta'ala. Na'am, tawadun. Ahsanallah ilayk. Fa'amma aqsamu al-kalami fa'aqallu ma yatarakkabu minhu al-kalam usman, aw ismu wa fi'l, aw fi'lu wa harf, aw ismu wa harf. Yeah, so the first discussion the Shaykh he brings in the book, all of that was an introduction to the book. This is where the book starts, but 
the topic that he's about to discuss now isn't really the crux of Usul al-Fiqh, but the book has now started. What is the first subject that he speaks about? Aqsam al-Kalam. The different types of speech. Why? Usul al-Fiqh is applied to what? Speech. Speech of the Prophet or the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to determine what constitutes as a minimum of speech for you to then be able to apply Usul al-Fiqh on it. And that's the first discussion. He says, Aqsam al-Kalam, the type of speech. Write this down. We are going to look at speech from three different perspectives. Just like a human being may be looked at from different perspectives. A human being may be looked at based on height and judged based on height. Not that it's right, but I'm saying he can be looked at based on height. Or looked at from a perspective of complexion. Or looked at from a perspective of weight. These are three different ways of looking at human beings generally. Likewise, the Shaykh is going to look at kalam from three different perspectives. We're still looking at the same thing, but different ways of looking at it. The first way he's going to look at kalam is bi'atibari tarkibihi, based on the formation of speech. What constitutes as speech? Bi'atibari tarkibihi, based on the formation of speech. What constitutes as speech? That's number one. Number two, bi'atibari madlulihi. Based on the meaning that comes out of certain words. Based on the meanings that come out of certain words. Number three. بِعْتِبَارِ إِسْتِعْمَالِهِ Based on the way that the word is used. Based on the way that the word is used or utilized. So again. Second one. بِعْتِبَارِ مَدْلُولِهِ Based on its meanings that come out of it. So, بِعْتِبَارِ تَرْكِيبِهِ Formation بِعْتِبَارِ مَدْلُولِهِ The meanings بِعْتِبَارِ إِسْتِعْمَالِهِ Its utilization or the way it's used The first one that he starts with is تَرْكِيب The formation of words He's going to determine what is the minimum of speech He says فَأَقَلُّ مَا يَتَرَكَّبُ مِنْهُ الْكَلَامِ The minimum of speech is as follows إِسْمَان Two nouns أو or اسم وفعل A noun and a verb Or a verb and a particle Or a noun and a particle Now before we come to this discussion There is a bit of knowledge of the Arabic grammar required In the Arabic language all different words are one of three types There is no other fourth type of word Every single word you see on paper Or is said by an Arab is one of three types of words. It's either an ism, a noun, or a fa'il, which is a verb, or a harf, which is a particle. A noun is what? Who can give me an example? Sayyar, qalamun, kitabun. These are nouns. Car, table, chair. These are nouns. Number two is fa'il, verbs. Like, hit. Make it in make it in English. Hit, bring, swim, run, jump. These are verbs. Particles are like what? In, under. The words that are like in, under, over, things like that. They don't have a meaning in and within itself. Its meaning is in the context. If I say brothers, in. What are you guys going to do? You're going to say in what? Brothers, under. What are you going to say? Under what? Is that? It has no meaning in and in within itself, but it requires something else to give it a meaning. So these are the three types of words in the Arabic language. What's the minimum of speech? Can I have a noun by itself? No. The minimum of speech is two nouns. Number one, he says, ismani. Two nouns. Like the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ad-dinu nasiha. Ad-dinu nasiha. This is two nouns. Again, because this is not a class of Arabic grammar, we're not going to go into why it's a noun, but just for now, write it down as an example. The reason it's a noun in a simple way, there's an alif lam. Al makes it a noun. Al 
They're both nouns. Okay? Or example, Allahu Samad. Allahu al Samad. Both of these words are nouns. The name of Allah is a noun. Of course, it's the name of Allah. It's a noun. Also, al Samad. It is also a noun. It is an alif noun. That's the minimum that constitutes as speech. Two nouns. And that's correct. Number two. The author, he says, Wasmun wa fa'il. A noun and a action. A noun and a action, a verb. One verb, one noun will become a minimum of speech, meaning minimum of a sentence, or something that makes sense. Example, Ja'a Zaydun. Zayd came. Which of these are is a noun? Zayd came. Which, which one is a noun? Zayd is a noun. Which one is the verb? Came. Good. So Ja'a Zaydun. Or like Allah says, Ja'a al haqqu Ja'a al haqqu The truth came. Which one is a noun? The truth. Which one is a action or a verb? Fa'l. Ja'a came. Make sense? That's the minimum of speech. These first two, the author is right in what he did. They are the minimum of speech. The other two that he includes, that is not a part of speech or minimum of speech as he says. Okay? We'll analyze why and I'll give you brief reasons and then we'll move on. The second one, he's, or the third one he brings is fa'alun wa haf. What is a fa'al? A verb. What is a haf? A particle. And the example that they use is ya rabb. Or Ya Allah. Ya is what? Harf nida, right? Harf, particle. Allah is what? The word Allah is what? A noun. A, a particle and a noun. They say, well, this is minimum of speech. It's not. It's not. Who knows why? Why is it not minimum of speech? And it's not true that one particle and one noun will formulate minimum of speech. Don't people sometimes say Ya Allah? Huh? So why do we say Shaykh? Because it's not speech, right? If somebody says Ya Ali, why do we not say it's Shaykh? <laughs> we say it's Shaykh, right? But then they'll say, no, no, I haven't, I haven't formulated a speech. How can you say it's Shaykh? And problematic, same thing. That's so what is about? It? What's, what's abnormal about it? I sent very good. So this yeah is a iwal. It's not just a yeah. It's, it replaces something else. Okay. So yeah, Allah. Actually, it does not just mean O oh Allah in Arabic. It it it's a iwal, or this yeah replaces. Something else, which is what it replaces the fa'il, like ad'u Allah, I am calling upon Allah, or unadi Allah, I proclaim to Allah. So the ya is what? Not a half in the in reality of the matter. What is it? Fa'il. It actually, when you look deeply and you analyze, it's actually a fa'il. Allah is a noun, no doubt about it. So this this third category that he brings goes back to second category. Does it make sense? So this category where he says a particle and a noun is actually what? A fa'il and a noun. Fa'il and an ism. So it goes back to the second anyways. There's no need to add this as a separate category. Make sense? Good. The next one he says, wasmun wa haf. A noun and a haf. Sorry. We did, and that was the fourth one. The third one he says, fa'ilun wa haf, right? Now, we did the fourth one and then we're going back to the third one. The third one is fa'lun and a half. Fa'l and a half. Example, if I'm saying, I'm having a discussion with somebody and we're discussing, did everybody get up or not get up? And I say, Akhi, did Zaid get up? Did Ahmed get up? And then Saeed says, Ma qama. Ma qama. Ma is what? A half. Qama is fa'l. Ma qama. 
Is it complete? So does he have to add anything else? Technically he made sense. He said no, he didn't stand up. So what is it? Is it speech? Minimum? Ma qama. Ma is what? Harf. Qama is? Fa'il. Harfun wa fa'il. Is that sufficient? Yes? I believe so. I believe so. Ah. Which is? Yeah, but when I say it, without the su'an, regardless, but you saying it, is it complete speech? If you said maqama, would we say he finished his, what he wanted to say? Or do we say there's still more to add? It made sense, right? He didn't stand up. Here again, this example that is used and this concept of a, a, a fa'il and a harf, eh? so a harf and a fa'il and a harf, is not a good example again because ma qama is not just ma qama in brackets there's a taqdeer which is ma qama ahm so the whole word is not just ma qama it's not a fa'il and a harf there's so then isn't there as well ma qama zaydu so he did if somebody says akhi did he did he come and i say no he didn't come we're discussing about a brother called Ahmed. He said, Ahmed, did, he, did Ahmed come? And I said, no, he didn't come. It's a bit different in English. But in Arabic, you would say, no, come. Or no, go. Something like that. No go. No bring. But no bring means, Ahmed didn't bring. There's the word Ahmed implied there, which is not even said. In any case, this goes back to, Ismum wa fa'il anyways. So the point is, the minimum of speech is what? Two nouns, or one noun and a verb. That's it. The other two that he brings go back to the first two. And that's just being more precise with what he mentions. Again, do you really need to know all of this? In a way, yes. As an introduction, inshallah. Now. والكلام ينقسم إلى أمر والنهي وخبر واستخبار وينقسم أيضا إلى تمن وعرض وقسم. Now this is looking at kalam again. We're still looking at the same thing, speech from a different angle based on the meaning that comes out of it. Break it down. Kalam based on the way that it comes out or the meaning that comes out of it. باعتبار مدلولي is two things. خبر إنشاء. That's it. خبر and إنشاء. Khabar, which right in front of it, information. Insha is leave it as insha. Leave it as insha. So khabar and insha. Khabar is what? The scholars they define khabar in many ways. The best definition of khabar is قَوْلٌ يَلْزَمُهُ الصِّدْقُ أو الكذب. A speech that you can or in it can be truth or falsehood. Statement that in it can be truth or falsehood. Or it accepts truth and falsehood. Regardless of whether the person is trusted or not, the fact that can you say true or false to the statement? Yeah, so you can say he's false. He said it true. That's, regardless of whether whether the the character doesn't matter. So khabar is like telling you an information, and you can say true or false. Example: If I say I met Khalid yesterday, what is that? Because you can say, Akhi, you're, you didn't, or you did. Make sense? But if I say, Akhi, bring me a pen, can you say true or false? You can't. That is insha. So speech can be either khabar or insha. Khabar is what? You can say true or you can say false too. Example, if something happened in the past, I say, Akhi, I met Tariq three days ago. What can you do? You can say you're right or you're wrong. This is called what? Khabar. 
But in sha' is what something you cannot say true and false to. The opposite of it. So if khabar, the definition of it is qawlun yalzamuhu al-sidqu aw al-kadhib then khabar is what? qawlun la yalzamuhu al-sidqu aw al-kadhib It does not accept true and false. That is in sha' That is in sha' Within in sha' Within in sha' is all the types that the sheikh mentioned like Amr, Nahi, uh, Amr, Nahi, Istikhbar, Tamanni, Arad, and Qasam. All of those other categories fall under Insha. So it's either Khabar or Insha. Khabar we all make sense of, right? If I say, for example, who can give me an example of Khabar? News, yeah, but what kind of news? Give me an example. It was sunny yesterday. What else? The sky is blue, and you can say true or false too. These are what? Khabar. In Sha, who can give me an example? Something that you cannot say true and false to. Any command or any prohibition. Sit here. Don't sit here. Go there. Don't go there. These are what? In Sha, you can't say true. Somebody says don't go there. Are you going to say true or false? <laughs> you can only what? Do or not do. You can implement what he's telling you to do or not implement. So, so that is insha. Does everybody understand the difference? So insha is further divided into amr and nahi. So an amr is what a command. Example, come, sit, don't go, bring, sorry, bring, sit, run, jump. These are what? Umur, commands. Awamr, sorry, awamr. And a nahi is? The opposite. Don't sit. Don't run. Don't speak. These are what? Prohibitions. They all fall under insha. Then the Shaykh he says, Wastikhbar. Istikhbar is what? Istifham. Asking a question is a form of insha. For example, if I say to the brother, Did you see Ahmed yesterday or not? Can he say true or false? No. He has to give an answer. He has to give an answer. He can't say true and false. What does he say? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. This falls under insha, not khabar. Okay? You can change it into a khabar. How? If somebody says, I saw Ahmed yesterday, it becomes a khabar. But if you say, did you see Ahmed yesterday, it's insha. Okay? That is istikhbar. After istikhbar, he says, tamanni. Tamanni. Tamanni is wishful thinking. Is when you wish and you desire for something to happen that is very unlikely for it to happen. You're not you're not you're not saying something that happened in the past for it to be true and false. You wishing for something is wishful thinking. Example someone saying Late Shabab Yaudu Yawma. I wish one day I am young again. I wish. You can't say true false to it. It's just wishing, hopeful wishing. Or somebody says, لَيْتَ I wish I have money so I can do hajj with it. This that you cannot say true and false to it. Does that make sense? It's all insha. Another category of insha, he says, وَعَرَض عَرض is another form of insha. عَرض is, is asking in a nice way. Asking in a nice way. So you're not commanding them to do something, it's politely asking. For example, somebody says, Ala tanzilu indana. Should you not come to my house? You haven't said to him, Come to my house. If you said, Come to my house, what is that? Khabar. It's an khabar. Sorry. It's an amr. It's an amr. It falls under inshab, it's an amr. But if you say, What? Should you not come to my house? It's funny because it's a brother. It's not related directly, but he sometimes if you see somebody eating, he says, Akhi, nice food. He doesn't, he doesn't give an amr. He doesn't command you to give it to him. What does he say? Khabar. This is, it's nice food, Akhi, mashallah. That's it. Huh? Say no. Say no. False. Nah, false. You can't. Yeah. Just say no. <laughs> 
So out. Then qasam is what? Halif. Qasam is taking an oath. Is it a khabar? No. Because you can't say true. If somebody says wallahi, can, is that, can you say true? No. Can you say false? No. So it falls under insha. But it's not a command. He's not commanding you to do something. He's simply taking an oath. Okay? For example, somebody says, Wallahi la'af'alan al khayra. Wallahi, I will do something good. Can you say true? Can you say false? Well, he said, I will do in the future. You can't say true and false. So, and you can't act upon, you can't go do something, and he's not commanding you. What is it? It's a form of insha. Does everybody understand? Okay. If he says, I will do. No, khabar is always in the past. Because you can't say true, you will go and because you don't know the future, right? It's still under insha. Genuine insha. No, generally just insha. So anything that is not khabar automatically is insha. But these are some of the categories, I don't think you mentioned all of them. Make sense? Yes? So this is looking at kalam based on second perspective, which is bi'atibari. Based on its meanings that come about. The last way and perspective of looking at khabar, and this is not the most complicated, but this is the most discussion the scholars have had regarding the issue of kalam, which is based on the usage of a word. And here, based on the utilization of a word, the words are only of two types. Haqiqi and majazi. Literal, figurative, that's it. It can be divided into two. So literal speech, which is called haqiqa, and majaz is figurative or metaphorical speech. So using the word metaphorically or literally, that's it. And this is where there's a whole discussion of does metaphors or do metaphors exist in the Quran or not? Is there a metaphorical speech in the Quran? Yes or no? We'll come to it. Number Tfadr. Ahsan Allah ilayhi. Wa min wajhin akhara yanqasimu ila haqiqatin wa majaz. So he says from another angle it's divided into haqiqa and majaz. Which angle? Isti'mal. Based on the utilization of kalam. Now. Ahsan Allah ilayhi. Fal haqiqa. Haqiqa is what? Literal speech. Ahsan Allah ilayhi. Ma baqiya fil isti'mal. So, whatever remained you being used for what it was placed for by the Arabs. Example. Haqiqa is when something I mean literal. For example, if I say lion, what do you guys understand? Huh? Animal. Everybody understands an animal. The, the, Al Haywan al Muftaris, the predator, with canines and, and, a, and a mane and everything, claws, and that's what you understand. Why do you understand that? Why do you understand that? Why do you, huh? Associated to what? No, but why I say lion, why do you understand the animal? Why reality? It has many other meanings. There's no name though. Huh? There's no reason for you to assume it's something else. That's, no, the word, again, in English, the word lion is for the animal. That, the word lion was placed for this animal. Like Asad was placed by the Arabs for the animal. The people who invented English or came about with English, they used the word lion to mean the animal. That's it. That's because the people who had who brought about the language use the word line for the animal. That's why we use it, and that's the default position. But if I say Ra'aytu Asadan Yahtub, I saw a lion giving khutbah. What are you going to think about lion here? So you don't imagine a lion an animal sits standing giving khutbah. Why not? So here I'm using the word lion not based on what it was placed for by the people who speak English. 
but with a different meaning of it that is less likely, but in this context, the more likely. If I said I saw a lion, you automatically think animal. But if I say khutbah, giving khutbah, giving a sermon, because I said giving a sermon, that now restricted the concept of lying to a brave person. Make sense? This is metaphorical. This is majazi. So when he says, now, waqila, so before he comes to majaz, when defining haqiqa, he gave you two definitions. The first definition is ma baqiya fi isti'mali ala mawdu'ahi. Using a word by which it was placed for. By who? The people who speak the language. So if I say car, what do I mean? Whatever the English people use the word car for. If I say sayyara, whatever the Arabs mean when they say sayyara, that's it. And he gives you another definition and he says waqila. And remember, every time you see the word qila, the author believes or the person who says it believes it to be the weaker opinion. Qila means it is said. If I say there's two things, uh, and then I say it is said, there's a third one. By nature, what do you think? When I say it is said, the third one is a weak opinion. I don't believe it to be strong. So whenever you see the word qila, it's like tadaif, to show you weak. That opinion is weak. So according to the author, this second definition of haqiqa is a weak one, which is mastu'amila fihi fi mastuliha alayhi min al mukhatabati is whatever is placed by people who speak the language or in normal conversation like lion whatever we understand as lion that is lion according to them so what's the difference between the first meaning and the second the first one is according to how it was placed by the people who developed the language or introduced the language the second definition says it's based on what we sp the people who speak the language that's the slight difference in any case we're not going to go into too much detail now Majaz is ma tujuwiza. Again, what's what's bad about this definition? Majaz tujuwiza. He's repeated the word or the thing he's trying to define in the definition. Majaz ma tujuwiza. What is this called? Circular reasoning or dawran or dawr. You're not allowed to. Again, it's seen as weakness in definition. The word majaz, to give you an understanding based on what it means, majaz, it, it comes from the word crossing, to cross something. And he says, ma tujuwiza, meaning it crossed something. Something has a usage in the language, but then it crosses that meaning and goes to another meaning. Like lion, the original meaning of the word lion is a animal. It crosses that meaning and flies and flies and flies and lands onto another meaning. It passes over that meaning, goes to another one. That's why it was called majaz. He says, It flies from whatever it's used and placed for by the Arabs or the English speakers, and it goes to another meaning. Okay, and that's again defining the word majaz. There's not much benefit in going back and forth regarding it. Now. Now, then he comes to discussion of haqiqa. Haqiqa is a reality. The reality of things are one of three types. Haqiqa lughawiya, reality in the Arabic language, or shara'iya, in the sharia, or urfiya, according to the norms of the people. Meaning, words have a usage in the Arabic language, like the word salah, what is the haqiqa lughawiya? Linguistic usage of the word salah, not sharia, ah, linguistic. One of them now, that's the weaker. Salu, that's some scholars say that's the word salu, not salah. Salah means a dua. It means a dua. In the Arabic language, salah means supplication. Okay? That's the reality. Or, for example, the word siyam. Siyam in the Arabic language means what? Imsak, to withhold. Withhold. Any kind of withholding is called siyam. That is what the word siyam means in the Arabic language. Now these two words in the sharia mean something else. Salah in the sharia means what? 
you know, in the Sharia. Pray, pray. Pray, pray, which is an act of ibadah that begins with the takbir, Allahu Akbar, and ends with the sleep. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In it is speech and actions. That is what salah is, prayer. And what kind of meaning of prayer is that? Based on the Sharia. Just like Psalm or Siyam, based on the Sharia is what? An act of worship. Where? Withholding from food and drink from sunrise to sunset. That is his Siyam. This is the meaning of fasting according to the Sharia. Make sense? So There's a third kind of meaning which is a Urfiya. Which is based on the norms of the people. Which is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding a husband and a wife. وَعَاشُرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Live with them bil ma'roof in goodness. Now goodness, what does that mean? A husband is meant to live with his wife in goodness. What is goodness? Did the scholars define the goodness? No. Does the Arabic language define the goodness? No. It goes back to the norms of the people. For a sister living in the UK, goodness is um, how many bedroom houses? Two? Two, huh? Some sisters in the villa and palace and stuff like that. So it goes back to the norms of the people. Uh, for example, the norms of the people, this urfiyya is two types. The urf is of two types. There's a urf, aam and khas. A general urf and a specific urf. A general urf means what? Everybody understands this to be the norms. Everybody understands it to be the norms. It applies everywhere. Example, and I'll give you an example outside words, so nothing to do with words, but just something outside. Generally, wherever you are in any part of the world, if you buy an appliance that is new, you expect it to be in a box. You go to China, you go to Africa, you buy a brand new phone, you expect it to be what? In a box. That's a reality everywhere in the world. But there are certain realities that are restricted to specific cultures, not other cultures. Okay? So the reality that of the language, if a language is used in a specific way across the board, this is called what? Orfiyya. According to the entire, so the entire globe uses the word in this specific way. I'll give you an example. And the word adabba means what? Beast. So according to the Arabs, Dabba kullu ma yadubba ala al-ard. Anything that traverses the earth is called a Dabba. Anything that moves on the earth is called a Dabba. I am a Dabba, you are a Dabba, a snake is a Dabba, a car is a Dabba, a plane is a Dabba. No, actually a plane isn't because that's in the sky. But anything, a, a train and a bus, they're all Dawab. But that's Haqiqa what? Lughawiyya. Haqiqa, urfiya, according to the norms of the people, a dabba is anything that traverses the earth but has feet on four, four legs, like cows and sheep and goats and don donkeys. Okay? And now that we have cars, does it have four legs? What if a car has six legs or six wheels? Do you guys consider it to be a dabba? So when you sit in it, do you make the dua of riding a beast? Yes, that off, that's the norms of the people. So, even, right. if well. even if in a suit, exactly. So the point is, these are just different ways and realities of looking at things. And the reason why this is important is because sometimes you come to an ayah in the Quran. For example, um, layl or nahar. The word layl in the Quran, what does it mean? Night, but what, what, what is night? After Aisha, that's Arfiya, right? According to the norms of the people here, after Aisha is night. But then how are you going to define that word lay? Based on the Urf, based on the Arabic language, based on the Sharia, well, there's an order that you follow. The first haqiqa that you will jump to is always Sharia. If something has a reality in the Sharia, that a meaning is given presence before anything else. Layl, was it defined by the Sharia? No, it wasn't. So the ayah in the Quran, Layl, 
and Nahar wasn't defined by the Prophet. The Prophet never said, Layl is this and Nahar is this. Good? Then he jumps to the second one, which is what? Lua or Urf? It depends. Sometimes Lua and sometimes Urf. Okay? But generally, Lua. And then, if you don't have it in the Lua, it goes to the Urf. So, for example, the word Sefer, traveling. Musafir, when are you considered to be a traveler? Do we have anything in the Sharia that tells us when? That is explicit? Uh, did the Prophet say Safar is X, Y, and Z? No, the Prophet never said. He never defined and said traveling is 200 kilometers. Did the Prophet mention that? Is there hadith? No. The Prophet never defined Safar. Go to the next one. In the Arabic language, is there something considered to be Safar, a distance? No. In the Arabic language, is Safar is just traveling, regardless of whatever distance is it. And then we go to the norms of the people. And that's why we define Safar based on the norms. Because every other thing is excluded. Some words, like for example, Qur'a. The word Qur'a is وَالْمُطَلَّقَاتُ يَتَرَبَّسْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرْعَ The divorced woman, she should stay in a waiting period for three Qur'a. What is a Qur'a? Here the scholars differ. The Prophet never defined it. The, in the Arabic language, it can mean purity and it can mean three cycles of purity. So it can mean impurity, menses, and it can mean purity. And that's why there's a whole discussion amongst the scholars. A waiting period for a woman, is it three menstrual cycles or three purity cycles? And it makes a difference. Okay? So the point is, these haqqaiq are used in the sharia and you'll be surprised. Just a while ago I was studying Kitab al with one of my teachers. And the mas'ala stopped, it was a standpoint. And the Shaykh used Haqiqa Shari'iyah as an evidence. I said, Allah Akbar. And I, I wanted to argue against the Shaykh, but then he came with, it's a Haqiqa Shari'iyah, so it's constricted with that meaning. You can't give it another meaning now. I said, okay, Shaykh, you're right. So, so it gives it proof, it gives it evidence, it gives a weight to a argument. So this is again Haqiqa Shari'iyah and Lughawiyah. Now. Okay. You know, for the example of um, wiping of the cough, mm. so it is a defining what a cough is. There's no definition in terms of the Sharia. And then um, I've heard an opinion that it goes back to the author of the people. Yes. So then, the scholars who say that, do they then mean that there's no lawful meaning for a cough? So again, in the issue of cough, is there a Sharia definition? No. no, Sharia never said a cough is has to be from this, right? Is there linguistic? No, Urfi, yes. Urf of who? At the time of the Sahaba, the Khuf was what? Leather socks. That's the reality. Now, there's another issue which is can we now extend that to socks and other things? Yes or no? Yes, based on what? Huh? It's the Urf of the people. No, the Urf the, the stays where it is because that's where the Urf was. Yes, analogy. Now you can take analogy and apply it. Okay. But initially, there was no linguistic meaning for There's no linguistic meaning for no. Not that I'm aware of. No. In certain words, in the Arabic language, there is no reality of it like that. Uh, Safar is a traveling, but it's not defined in a specific way. Night is night, but when does night start? Does it start after Maghrib? Does it start after Aisha? Does it start after Asr? It's not defined in the Arabic language. And, and just to give you an ex another example of, of majaz, majaz is also like the word maut. What does the word maut mean? Death. death. That is what haqiqa or majaz, haqiqa, if I say death, what does it mean? Death. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked about the in-laws and the Prophet ﷺ said, alhamu al-maut, in-laws is death. What did the Prophet mean? Majaz. You're not going to look at your in-laws and just die, right? Fall dead. What does that mean? It means your in-laws are just like death. Just as death is severe and it comes suddenly and it's a great danger, like that, your in-laws, when they come suddenly, one thing leads to another, suddenly, and it's a great danger upon your religion. 
what that meaning of mawt here is now what? Majasi. To make sense? now, so the Shaykh now goes into a discussion of the types of majaz, types of metaphors used in the Arabic language. The Shaykh he brings you four ziyada with an increase, nuqsan with a decrease, naql with a transferring, isti'ara with a borrowing. These four types of majaz. The Arabic or the scholars of Balagha, eloquence, they take majaz into 25 different types. Huh? What do you say? Surprise. 25 types of metaphors in the Arabic language. The science of bayan, ilmul bayan in Balagha is one of the 25 types. I come study 25 types of metaphors. Sah? So in any case, again, this science or this part of usul al-fiqh is borrowed from Balagha, from the Arabic language. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail, but I'll give you simple examples of all of it. By default, by default, if I say something, which meaning do you take it to? Real, literal, or figurative, metaphorical? Literal. If I say car, you always think real car. You never think of a metaphorical meaning for speed or something. No, you think car. Does it make sense? If I say lion, you're going to think of an animal, you're going to think of brave. If I say he's a bahar, or I, there's a bahar, ocean, you think of ocean, right? But if I say I saw a man who was a bahar, but this man is an ocean, what does that mean? It's an ocean in knowledge, then it becomes a metaphor. But by default, what is it? Always the literal meaning, always the literal meaning. So he gives you majaz, and majaz is of two types, and again, Without going into too much detail, there's two different main types of majaz, but these are examples of majaz. Now, the first type of majaz, and we'll take it from what the Shaykh mentions, is bizziyada, with an increase. Something extra gives you that metaphorical meaning. Without it, no metaphorical meaning. Example, the example that I gave, ra'aytu asadan, I saw a line. When I add the extra word, يَخْطُبُ giving a sermon, that moves it to the metaphorical. So what made it metaphorical is an extra addition of a word, sometimes even of a letter. Like the example that the Shaykh says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like Allah. Now this kaf, if you remove it, the sentence structure is okay. If I say لَيْسَ مِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing is like Allah, it's the same thing. So what is this kaf? Even though some scholars, they call it ziyada. We say there's nothing ziyada in the Quran. There's no extra letter in the Quran. So some people say it's ziyada. But again, we don't call it that out of respect for the Quran. But it is, in the Arabic language, if you removed it, the sentence will still be complete. So why was it added? The scholars they say is to emphasize there's absolutely nothing that resembles Allah is for emphasis. This kaf is emphasis. So it came with a purpose. Okay, it came with a purpose. Number two is bin nuqsan. You give it a metaphorical meaning based on reducing. For example, was al qariya. Ask the village. Surah Yusuf, right? Ask the village. Village. Will you go to the village and ask the walls of the village? Will you ask the trees of the village? Huh? No. You go to the. Did you go to the boundaries of the village and ask the, the trees and the walls? No. What are you going to ask? The people, right? So Ask the people of the village. So this word "people" was removed and it gave it a metaphorical meaning. Okay. So it was based on. Removing. Which word was removed? People. وَاسْأَلْ أَهْلَ الْقَرْيَةِ Number three is النقل. 
by transferring, by transferring. And this is like the word غائط, غائط. غائط in the Arabic language means مكان منخفض, a low place. A low place is called غائط. The Arabs and people back in the day, when they used to relieve themselves, they, could, they don't have toilets like we have today. What do they have? Go far away in the desert, find a low place, do your business there and come out. That place where they used to do their business in used to be called غائط, a low place. It's like this, it comes down. That place was called غائط. Now in Arabic, when I say غائط and bowl, bowl is what? Urine. غائط is feces. Because of the usage of غائط, غائط, غائط so much regarding that place, because it became close to feces, may Allah honor you guys, people now call the thing that comes out of the people, feces, as غائط. So the meaning got transferred from that place to the actual feces itself, may Allah honor you. Make sense? So this is called Al Majaz bin Naql. The meaning got moved. Okay? Make sense? Number three is Bil Isti'ara by borrowing. By borrowing. Something is the meaning, metaphorical meaning to pl- implied by borrowing. And borrowing means something has such a close resemblance. Now, here, why did we call it Naql? Because a place that is low has no direct relation with feces. Direct. The next one, isti'ara, there is a relation or a characteristic between the first thing and the second thing that makes them similar. So for example, jidaran yuridu an yaqaltu. A, a wall, as Allah says, yuridu, wishes to yaqaltu, fall apart. Now question, does a wall have a desire? No. Why did Allah call it Yuridu? Metaphorical. It just means the wall was so close to falling down. Now, the meaning of Yuridu in this ayah is what? Yamilu. It's inclining it, but to fall apart. But because the desire of a human and the desire of the wall was the similar thing, it gave, got given the meaning, that's it. And it was used in a metaphorical way. Just like a wall, may or would have had a desire to lean because it was leaning and if I'm leaning I'm desiring one side that's it it's a resemblance it was borrowed okay it was borrowed Isti'ara. again a lot of this might not make too much sense to you guys first time hearing it again it doesn't concern you directly in usul al-fiqh but this is just to go through the method inshallah ta'ala. so these are examples of uh, majaz now the last issue I want to discuss and then we'll stop inshallah ta'ala which is majaz, does it exist in the Qur'an? Is there anything such as a metaphorical meaning or word in the Qur'an? Yes? No? No majaz, huh? Yes. So you said there is, because wall doesn't have a desire, that's metaphorical, Jamil. How do you refute that? Can you say that that's just how the Arabs study Quran? So this is the argument of Muhammad Amin al Slub Arab, that's how the Arabs speak, it's not metaphorical. Repeat him. That means the Arabs just speak Arabic. So the point is, there is a difference of opinion. There is a difference of opinion. There are three main views regarding this. The first view is there is no metaphor in the Arabic language. It does not exist. And those who said this is Muhammad Amin al shinqiti rahimahullah ta'ala, the great Imam. It doesn't exist. No, in the Quran or the Arabic sorry, In the Quran it doesn't exist. No, in the Arabic language. There is no majaz in the Quran. So they say, what is then majaz? It is what? Just a Arabs. So the Arabs have a way of speaking. This way of using metaphors is the Arab's way of speaking, but in the Qur'an, there is nothing that is metaphorical. So when Allah says face, face is literal. When Allah says this, this is literal. When Allah says night, it's literal. When Allah says wall, it's literal. Everything is literal in the Qur'an. And the reason, and again, this, uh, this belief or this opinion is supported, or one of the other peoples that take this opinion, is Dawood al-Dahiri, from the Dahiri Madhab. 
and also <clears throat> other scholars as well they take this opinion and it's attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah it's attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn Al-Qayyim in fact Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala considered it to be one of the Tawarid he called it Al-Tawud the Majaz metaphors he said it's Tawud Tawud is what? The oppressive thing he says is Tawud Majaz is Tawud in any case that is one opinion no majaz in the Quran whatsoever. Second opinion, there is majaz in the Quran, they say. There is. And this is the opinion of Ibn Hazmin, Al Amidi, and Al Shawkani. These are the opinions of Ibn Hazm, Al Amidi, and Al Shawkani. And they use the ayah, just like our brother mentioned, جِدَارٌ يُرِيدُ أَيَّا قَلْضًا A wall that wishes, metaphor. Or, أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِبِ غَائِبِ again was used. So they say it's metaphorical, it exists in the Qur'an, don't try to deny it. It is in the Qur'an, metaphors. Third opinion, and the correct opinion, which is, metaphors exist in the Qur'an, but there are conditions for them. They have to satisfy conditions. Not everything is metaphorical. There are conditions of metaphors to be used in the Quran. Yeah. But there is conditions. So the first one, they will say it exists unrestricted without conditions. The second one say there is conditions for you to consider to be a metaphor. Okay. This third opinion is actually the real or the final opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah's final opinion is this one. He says, إِثْبَاتُ الْمَجَازِ مَعَ الْقَرَائِنِ With external factors and conditions. And he mentions this in his Risala al madaniya and Tuhfat al araqiya which is one of the last few works of Ibn Taymiyyah. So the final and real opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah is what? Metaphors exist in the Qur'an with conditions. Okay? Now, one thing we all have to clarify, the scholars like Muhammad Amin and Shanqiti, the reason he wanted to say metaphors don't exist in the Quran is trying to push away the people of Kalam, the Asha'ira and the Mu'tazila, when they come to Allah's attributes and they say face is metaphorical, it actually means power. Or Allah descends, they, they say no, it doesn't mean Allah, it means Allah's mercy. And they give you other meanings like that. To stop that and close that gate, these groups of scholars said, no majaz in the Qur'an, what are you talking about? That's why, why they did it. But if you take the third opinion, and then you come with Ibn, uh, Imam Abdul Bar, Al-Maliki rahimahullah ta'ala, in his Kitab Al-Tamheed, he brings you an ijma' from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een that majaz cannot exist in the names and attributes of Allah. When it comes to Allah's names and attributes, there is no metaphors. Case closed. There is no metaphors. When it comes to Allah's names and attributes, there is nothing such as metaphors. It's an ijma' of who? Tabi'een and the Sahaba. There is no majaz in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of Allah's attributes are al haqiqah that they are the reality. And this is what a balanced opinion. If you say you don't say it's unrest unrestrictedly exists in the Quran, or unrestrictedly does not exist in the Quran, we have a balanced opinion. We say it does exist with conditions. What are the conditions of majaz? I'll mention it to you briefly, but we're not going to go into too much detail. Number one, there needs to be a ilaqa, a resemblance or a link between the real meaning and the metaphorical meaning. There needs to be a link. Number one. Number two, there needs to be an external factor that prevents the original meaning from applying, which is called a qarina. There needs to be a external factor that prevents for you to believe the original meaning, the real meaning. 
And some scholars add other conditions will satisfy and suffice with this and give you some examples. So example, I saw a lion. Literal. When I say I saw a lion giving khutbah, what do I mean by a lion giving khutbah? A brave man or a brave woman, a brave person. Now, the link between a brave person and a lion is a seen. A lion is brave and a person who is courageous is brave. There is a link. And there is something in the sentence that removed it from the original meaning, which is giving a sermon, giving a khutbah. Another example, Bahar. The word Bahar means what? An ocean. If I say, Ra'aytu Baharan, I saw an ocean. What do you understand? No. Water. Yeah. But if I say, Ra'aytu Baharan, Yakhtubu, I saw a lion, I saw, I saw a ocean giving khutbah. Now, what do you understand it? The water giving khutbah? Standing on the member saying, In Alhamdulillah, what do you understand? A knowledgeable person. Is there a link between a knowledgeable person and the ocean? Yes. yes. Vastness. The ocean is vast. A knowledgeable person is vast in the knowledge he possesses. There is a link. What was the qarina? What was the external factor that prevented you from using the original meaning? The word yakhtubu. Make sense? So these are the kind of conditions we're trying to say. It does exist with these conditions. Okay? But in the names and attributes of Allah, can it ever exist? No. Why? Ibn Abdul Bar brings you an ijma'ah. No. Inshallah ta'ala will stop here for now. Ta'ala. If anybody has any questions, if the sisters have any questions, you can send them through inshallah ta'ala. Any questions? No? It's crystal clear today, huh? Very easy lesson. Was it easy? I'm not a sheikh. Sorry. You were mentioning, uh, you said may Allah honor you when you were mentioning these yeah. things. Is that a sunnah? Not sunnah, no, it's just the Arabs' way of speaking. When they yeah. mention these things? Yeah, it's not, not, not like a sunnah. Not that I know of. No. Yeah. You say, Akramakum Allah, may Allah honor you and things like that. Yeah. It's not appropriate to speak about things like that generally, so it's just, it's more of a polite way of saying, apologize for what I'm about to say. When we discussed the types of one and the 60 and the 40. The type of? The types of the one. The one, yeah. Perception. Now we discussed like the 60 and the 40. Can we say that the difference between when it's blameworthy and not blameworthy is like the level of sincerity? Because you talked about the first one. It depends. So if there's 60%, you believe it to be the right opinion. And you, it's become clear to you, but you still choose the 40%, and that's the blameworthy one. It's the one that is marjuh. When you know the other one is the rajah. The other one is the correct opinion. That's what it is. You were mentioning the four types of men on speech. Yes. Like Ismani, two nouns, ismun wa fi'l, and that's it. And then the other two, there was something about ya. Uh, yeah. Ya Allah, and how I say ya Ani is not shirk. I'm a little confused. Now, this is the brother who was trying to discuss with him, but the word ya, yeah, does it constitute ya? Yeah, is a what? Haf. Allah is a, or the name Allah is a, ism. So, hafun wa ismun, we said that is not really what it looks like from the beginning. And the first aspect you think it's a harf and a ism, it's not. That ya yeah is actually a fa'al. Idu'u Allaha, aw unadi Allaha. So it's actually a fa'al. So it's a fa'al and a ism. So it goes back to the first category. Now the reason I was discussing with him is because he said, what did he say? Yeah, so what constitutes as a sentence? So if you say minimum is a fa'al, a harf and a ism, and he was trying to say it's what? Complete or not complete? It's not complete. So I said if you say it's not complete, the Shia I can say, look, I can say Ya Ali. And my sentence is not complete, so you can't blame me for saying doing shirk. Because I haven't completed my sentence. Make sense? It's a bit, it was off topic anyways. In, in, but the ruling of Ya Ali or Ya Muhammad, it is shirk, no doubt about it. Because Ya is not just 
calling upon it is ma'at talab. There is request in it. There is request in it. So you're not allowed to say stuff like that. That's different. You can call upon him with conditions. No. Like he's alive, he's present, he's able to do what you request him to do. But if you call upon somebody like Ali ibn Abi Talib, he's dead. And you only call upon him believing that he has attributes like al-basar, that he can hear you from afar, he can listen to you from afar. That is giving an attribute of Allah to other than Allah. No. And become shaykh. Is there a way I can look into how ya becomes a fi'l? How ya becomes a fi'l? It's a iwal. They say it's in the Arabic language, it replaces the word. It's in, in Nahu. If you study Nahu, it's a part of understanding it. Harufu al Munada. It's in Ajrumiya it's in Ajrumiya as well. Go to any explanation of Al Ajrumiya, you'll find uh, what is called Harufu Nida. The letters that people use in order to call out to people. And one of them is Ya. Ya Fulan, O Fulan, O such and such. There's a question from the sister. What is the majaz that is present in the ayah? Kamithrihi shayn. The majaz that is present in the ayah is a form of majaz which they say is the addition of the kaf. So without the kaf, the meaning is what? Fine, it works. If you just say laysa mithlihi shay or mithlu shay, sentence is okay. That kaf is added to give an emphasis on the meaning. So the majaz, they say, it's a form of majaz, so it's using it in a majazi form, which is what? Kamithlihi shay, nothing that resembles Allah, that's it. Does that make sense? Huh? No? Yeah? Okay. Shalom. Basit. Sim basic or simple is called basit. Okay. Next question. For scholars who take the view of majaz, it does not exist for the sake of preventing ta'wil of Allah's names and attributes. Was this only reason they took that view? If so, is it permissible to take a view that prevented from a perceived harm? It's a good question. They took it, and I didn't say that's the only reason why they did it. It's one of the reasons, or the reasoning behind why they did it, is that was a push for them to try to prove that majaz doesn't exist in the Qur'an. And again, Al Imam Muhammad Amin al Shanqiti rahimahullah ta'ala is an Imam in the Lugha. He memorized Lisanul Arab, which is a dictionary. He memorized it, right? So he, when he uses the Arabic language, he's not trying to prove something just to prove a point. He has an evidence. And Sarahatan, a lot of the opinions that even the opinions that I don't take of Shaykh Muhammad Amin al Shanqiti rahimahullah ta'ala, I still believe there's a lot of strength to the way that he brings about his arguments. And some of the brothers, when we discuss the issue of whether the uncle of the, uh, the father of the Prophet وسلم, is in the hellfire or not, they bring brought me the statement of Muhammad Amin al Shanqiti, and it's very convincing. And I can see why. Because the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala will quote you Arabic poetry, how this word is used in this way. So he was saying it from an angle of genuine and intellectual angle, like he wasn't trying to just prove it just to stop it. Again, we have the concept of bab said the to stop an evil before it reaches. But again, the reality is you can't escape the reality of there is majaz. You can't escape it. So you don't choose an opinion simply because it's better for our aqidah or it's in line with our aqidah. We go where the evidence takes us and there is truth behind the fact that there is majaz in the Quran. So if and again Muhammad Amin and Shaqiti and some of the opinions, they would call it Uslub Arabi. They would call it is the Arabic way of speaking. That's their justification. We'll call it whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, it is met metaphor. <laughs> yeah, call it what you want to call it. It is a majaz at the end of the day. So again, all of the parties, and this is one of the amazing things, is every single party of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, like in this case, Muhammad Amin and Shaqiti, rahimahullah, Ibn Taymiyyah on the other corner who took the third opinion, each one was trying to go closer to the truth. And their aim was not just to prove a point or to be on the safe side for Aqidah. 
And this is one of my teachers he mentioned that the disagreement of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah is an indication of their agreement. And the fact that people within Ahlul Sunnah differ is a sign that they actually are in agreement. What are they in agreement for? We need to follow the evidence. We need to obey Allah and His Messenger. We need to find the truth. That's their agreement. But it made them go to different directions. And there's nothing such as that's nothing that is actually bad. So what was the question again? Now, so is it permissible to take the view? No, you follow the view that is the correct opinion, inshallah. So don't take a view just because there's a harm behind following a, another view and this is the safest view for your aqidah. No, you follow the opinion that is the correct. And again, just because we say the first one there is no majaz in the Quran does not mean the third opinion is not safe in aqidah. It is. How do we make it safe for aqidah? There is the ijma' of Ibn Abd al -Bar. Yeah, we took out everything besides names and attributes and then we said Majaz does exist but just not in names and attributes. Why? Not because I feel like that's the strongest opinion because there's an ijma' in front of me. Yeah. Stop now, huh? you guys are sweating. <laughs> because it's hot? Yes. Okay, Barakallahu Feekum Mustafa Insha'Allah Ta'ala Barakallahu Feekum Anything good that I said is from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala any mistakes, any shortcomings, any errors is from me and Shaytan. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, istaghfiruhu wa tubu alayhi, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.